but in, it happened to be the the sixth question on the AP exam on what was the international exam in 2019. And, you know, I've talked about it in the past where the questions go from easy to hard. Um, so by the time you get to the sixth question, it's really hard. I don't, I don't really expect them to, to, to necessarily do that this year um, because I think it will be, it's easy to have that be the case when there's six questions and then there's multiple choice and, and there's this three hour exam. If there's one question that's 15 minutes of the exam, suddenly um, students don't get that, you know, you have, technically you have two hours and 45 minutes of testing that they've gone through. And so it, it becomes not as big a deal. Now, if, if they gave you a question as difficult as this one and kids didn't do it, I think that they would have a hard time distinguishing who knows what, because now it's 15 minutes out of a 45 minute exam rather than 15 minutes out of a two and out of a three hour exam. So I think conceptually there will be concepts on the exam like it. I just don't know if it'll be this hard. Now, I also think that after we go through this one, I have a feeling that now if I gave you a similar one and I'll maybe even look for a similar one, and just throw it on there, for, uh, on in in there for practice, and just say here, here's the and I can find one that has a has a solution key, and I'll even write a little note to myself that I'll just throw one on there, and then you can you can practice it and see if wow I, I you know because I'm see how you do um, I'm writing something down. It's hard to talk and write at the same time. So I'll just I'll just put a practice one up there um, to to kind of not to not to have you turn in necessarily, but just to say, okay, here, what if you now watched this um, video or you were here in office hours? Could you do the one that's similar? And my guess is the answer is going to be yes, because although this one was hard. I'm not sure it was as hard as I, I think some of you are going to go, oh, well, that didn't seem quite as hard now. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So let me present this. There's only seven of you, on, six of you on here, which is fine. I'll just How keep How many it. FRQs are going to be on the actual exam? The actual exam is going to be um, – one FRQ that's 25 minutes. That's the first one. So it's not going to be like a normal FRQ, I don't think. I think it's going to be, I think it might be their attempt to to ask you kind of a conglomerate of stuff um, that will be um, kind of a conglomerate of stuff that, that similar to the one the practice question that I gave today, number four, um, that'll be like 25 minutes. It's just a little longer, probably be worth more like 15, 20 points would be my guess. Um, and that one's, you know, 25 minutes and then you got five minutes to upload it. And then they open up another one that's 15 minutes long. Now they haven't said it, but it seems to me like that second FRQ that they give you is going to be more like a traditional FRQ um, because it's only 15 minutes and that's what you normally get for, for an, a question. So I, I'm going to guess that that's going to be a, be more like a normal FRQ. And um, then you do 15 minutes of that one. And then, and then you got five minutes to upload your results. So it's the first one's 25 minutes, five minutes to upload. Second one's 15 minutes and then five minutes to upload. So testing, they kind of say ends after 45 minutes, but it really extends to 50 minutes because you have five more minutes to upload the second question. Okay. Okay. So here's the question that, that you had and um, right away, you know, it's an implicit differentiation question. And then at the end, it's a, um, it's a related rates question. And so the first three, part A, B, and C, are kind of more along the lines of 
of um, other implicit questions, but I found them to be pretty heavy on the algebra, actually. Um, I found this to be super heavy. I'm gonna actually just copy this and, and, and run down here and paste it in so I can um, just start doing this part right down here. So if we just look at the first one, this is a pretty typical way that they would start out doing an implicit differentiation question where they essentially give you the answer. They say, okay, consider this curve, now show the steps that result in it. And really they're looking for, it's worth two points, but they're kind of looking for just one step and then jumping right to the answer. And remember, so when you're impl doing implicit differentiation on this, um, if I take this equation, 2x squared plus 3y squared minus 4x times y, and I said times in there because suddenly I know I'm going to have to use the product rule on that. So if I differentiate this with respect to y, what I would get is I would get 4x plus 6y. Now, since I'm differentiating y, I'm going to write dy dx. And we haven't done this. I mean, I think we did implicit differentiation the first time in like October, maybe. Um, is when we did it. Um, and now I'm going to use the product rule because of right there, I know that I'm going to use a product rule. And so I'm going to have minus 4 and derivative of x is 1. So then times y, then minus 4x, and the derivative of y is dy dx. So anytime you're differentiating y, you have to have a dy dx. And then the derivative of 36 is 0. So that's the first step. Now, there's an intermediate step if you really were going to simplify it. But what I would do, if you've done that right, if this was an actual exam question, what I would actually do is tell you to just jump right to the answer. You know that that's what's supposed to be the result because I told you that was supposed to be the result. And that is the result. Now, there is an intermediate step in there that you wouldn't necessarily have to have, but notice that um, if we if we were to move um, the 4x over, it would become negative 4x. If we moved the 4y over, it would become plus 4y. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense. Those aren't attached to the dy dx. And if you had factored out a dy dx, you still would have been left with 6y um, minus 4x. And the, what I wrote in pink and what I wrote in green is the exact same thing. One's just a, there's a negative multiplied through in the numerator, or actually the, they're just flipped around in the numerator and everything's divided by two. So you wouldn't need the pink step. Okay, because they, they don't they don't expect you to have the big step. They expect you to have this, and they expect you to have this. Now, you can't get the second point if you haven't gotten the th first point because they gave you they gave you what it's supposed to turn out to be. So you couldn't possibly get the second point if you didn't have the, the first one. Any questions on that? All right, so part B gets a little bit trickier, and they start asking you to kind of use this, this thing here. And find the slope of the tangent line when x equals 6. So, um, you know, you have this derivative that is this, and, and that is the slope of the tangent line. And we know that that's equal to, we know dy dx is equal to 2y minus 2x over 3y minus 2x. And we know x is equal to 6, but we got to figure out what y equals if we're going to do this. 
Okay, so we don't have Y, but we got to figure out what Y is in order for us to be able to do this. A um, couple key things is the idea when they start talking about um, the curve, if you look back at the stem of the problem, it talks about consider the curve. So that's what they're talking about. Whenever they reference the curve, it probably means you're going to have to um, use that that equation for the curve in order to, to calculate something. So what you kind of needed to do on this, which actually definitely needed to do, is you needed to say, well, if x equals 6, then um, 2 times 6 squared minus 3 times y squared minus 4 times 6 times y is equal to 36 because um, you know that that all I did is I just plugged in six in for um, in for x. I would guess that that what I wrote right there would be worth one point. Um, somehow knowing, oh, I have to go back to the curve. Now um, I'm going to guess that solving this would be another point, and this is where this one particular one was pretty heavy on algebra because if I solve this. Um, this should be a plus, I think. That's a that's a plus in there. If I remember if I yeah, that's a plus in there. Um, so solving this, I would have three y squared uh, minus twenty four y uh, plus thirty six is equal to zero. And all I did on that is I multiplied the four times the six to get negative twenty four. Um, at the beginning of this thing, 6 squared is 36 times 2 is 72. But then if I move that 36 from the right-hand side over, I'd have just 36 quantity. Now, i got to factor this. And this is where this becomes a little bit he heavier in algebra than I've ever seen a, a question um, like this, where if I factor out a 3, this would be y squared minus 8y plus 12 equals 36. So um, if I factor this, y minus 6 times y minus 2 equals 0. So then y has to equal 6 or 2. So at this point, now we know what two, those two points are. When they asked us at the beginning of this part of the problem, where they said, find the slope of the tangent line at each point when the curve equals when on the curve where x equals 6 so now we actually do have two points we have the point 6 comma 6 and we have the point 6 comma 2 are our two points so now our slope at like the first one 6 comma 6 all I'm going to do is I'm just going to put 6 in for y, 6 in for x, into the slope equation, and I'm not going to simplify it. Just going to leave that alone, and then I would do the same thing for 6 comma 2, and I would do... Um, so 2 times, whoops, 2 times 2 minus 2 times 6 over 3 times 2 minus 2 times 6. And then I just leave that, and that's my two answers. Um, I don't know how many points they make that. They may make that 3, I think. Um, Yeah, I guess that would be worth three points. I would maybe think that it would be one point for that, um, one point for that, and one point for the answers. I, I would guess. I mean, that's as near as guess I could have on that. Um, I don't have an answer key for it. So at that point, we're at five points, two points for part A, three points for part B, 
And now we're on part C. Any questions on what I did on that part? Okay, so so this is where you got to kind of kind of what I what I would and I would have been talking about this a lot more if we had been in school um, because I can predict a little more what the exam was in the past. But now is where even if you didn't know how to do this next part um, would be to start grubbing for points. Okay, so this is one where you're going to grub for points because um, when when I look at this part, it says on here, um, find all the, all the positive X values on which the curve has a vertical tangent line. So you kind of go, what do I know about vertical tangents? What I do know is I do know that the slope of a vertical line has to be undefined, right? That right there is actually worth a point. Just knowing, oh, I know I need to have a sl my slope be, be undefined. You could have written on this. Um, you could have also written that 3y minus 2x has to equal 0. That's the same idea, right? I mean, that's... That's the exact same thing. That's what we need. That's what we at least need to see. Now, um, this is where I'm, I'm confused on whether or not on how they might have parsed these points out. They may have said that's one point and there was one point for the answer, um, but you had to show the work that led to your answer. So this is a little bit, uh, this is why I thought this question was super difficult, but AP actually pointed this out as one of the questions conceptually that you needed to know for the exam this year. But again, I will post one that's easier. After I had posted this and I did the answer key this morning, I was like, wow, that is a really hard question. Um, so I'll post something a little bit easier and maybe even say, you know, try this one if you want for, for, the, same, for the same credit. And that'll help you out, Maddie, as far as that goes. And I'll just post an answer key with it right with it. So you can you can kind of try it and see your answer at the same time. Um, so if if I'm looking at that, um, one of the things that that I would go back to is notice that they talk about this curve thing again. They talk about this idea of the curve. Well, the curve was that thing that we started out with, right? I mean, that curve that 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 they talk about. Is this um, is this thing 2x squared plus 3y squared minus 4xy equals 36? So now you actually have this equation and this equation that we that we're going to merge together. We're gonna we're gonna kind of fit those two things together. So you know if you take that first equation. Um, that first equation, y is equal to um, two-thirds x. Does that make sense, what I did there? So if y equals two-thirds x, then we can do a little substitution in here, and we could say 2x squared plus 3 times two-thirds x squared minus 4x two-thirds x equals 36. And now I actually just have an equation that I just need to solve. Um, I, I will kind of go through some of the steps here so you can see what you do here. But essentially, you're combining like terms, solving for x, and just using the positive one because you can see right away that each of those terms is an x squared term. So eventually, you're going to have to take the square root of both sides which would mean you'd use plus or minus, and they asked for, and in the in the problem they asked for just the positive value, so we're only going to use the positive one. So if I think up here, I kind of go, okay, well, so this is two x squared plus three times four ninths x squared. If I square two thirds, I get four ninths minus 
4 times 2 thirds x squared equals 36. If I go through some arithmetic on here, and you, you technically wouldn't necessarily have to go through the arithmetic, um, but I think solving for x, the arithmetic, it probably be, it's probably easier in this case um, if, you, if you did, um, where this is plus 12 ninths um, x squared minus 6 thirds x squared equals 36. And I'm just not going to skip any steps. So I know that I could skip some steps, but I'm not going to um, just because I don't want you to get confused on, on what I have here. But this is 4 thirds x squared minus 6 thirds x squared equals 36. Two, another way of writing two, um, instead of writing that as two, I'm going to write that as six thirds, because then I have, um, I have everything, uh, and this should have been eight thirds, not, this should be eight thirds, sorry, because it's four times two. That should be eight thirds. And so now, if I add all these things together, I end up with two thirds x squared equals 36. So x is equal to 36 times 3 halves, where x squared is equal to that. So x is equal to plus or minus the square root, 36 times 3 halves. So our answer is x is equal to the square root of 36 times 3 halves. That's hard. I am not going to kid you. When I, when I started working this out, I was like, oh, boy, that one's, that one's a nightmare. Um, so I would guess that they'd tell you that, that this is one point. Um, but let's just think about this, this portion of it. You know, if we just think about this portion of this problem. Um, there was one point at the beginning for saying dy dx is undefined. Um, that was half the credit, half the credit for that part. So, you know, that's just knowing that that we're talking about vertical tangent lines, knowing that that means the slope is undefined. So the denominator has to be undefined. If they talked about a horizontal tangent, then the numerator would need to be undefined. Our numerator would need to be zero, or the derivative would need to be zero. So um, if you're talking about, you know, kind of the moral on this is when you're asked for a vertical tangent line, we make the numerator zero, or the denominator zero, and if we are asked for a horizontal tangent line, we make the numerator zero. And that's always going to be worth one point. And, and then you can kind of move on, on from there if you can solve the rest of it. Usually it, it involves taking that equation and merging it with the, with the curve. Um, sometimes um, this would be this idea right here would be worth one point, but now I'm going to end up giving out more than nine points. So I don't know how they parse this out because I don't have the ability to look at a rubric on this one because this was an international exam from last year. Any questions on that stuff, even though I know that was a lot? I just, like, don't know how I would think of doing that. Like, I get yeah. the first part, like, getting that undefined. But. So, so, so here's what I'm going to do, Maddie. Um, honestly, I'm going to give you, I, I will look for one that's similar in context. It probably will be, it may still be numbered five or six, but I'm going to look for one similar in context and, and give you kind of another chance to practice it. Cause it's not, I, I understand completely what you mean on, on that. And, and I don't think you're alone in, in feeling that way when, when you did this. In fact, um, Liz, I think in her email to me said, you're gonna see some really creative solutions on, on, on my work today. Um, and other people said, I ran out of time. I couldn't, I couldn't finish this one. Um, so by seeing this explanation and me giving you another one, if you do see something similar, I'm going to guess you're going to probably do better. Will you get nine out of nine? Maybe not. But again, you know, we're not 
looking for nine out of nine on this to get a five on the exam. So just let me get, do another one. I'll, I'll give another one. And if I need to answer any questions on it, or if you're, if you want to do more, um, uh, if you want, it, when I put the other one on there, if you, if it doesn't make sense and you want me to explain it uh, more, I will. And I, what I'll do is I'll actually put one on there. I'll put their rubric and maybe if it helps, I'll put, I'll put an answer key that how, how I would write it up. Cause sometimes um, there's a sort of, when they write their, their rubric, it's sort of ideal. So try that. And if it doesn't work, we'll, we'll figure another, another way and, and kind of have to let it go on that anyway. But one of the things about it is I pretty much, I'm pretty confident that given a similar problem, you could do part A and you could do, you could at least write the first step for part C. And now you would be at three points out of nine. And I think even if I show you the explanation for part D, even if you couldn't do it, when you had to do this problem, if I show it to you, I think you'd, you'd be able to adapt and then you get two more points and you have five out of nine and, and that would have been a really good score on the sixth problem of this exam. So, um, but I do know, I, I'm not gonna kid you, I, I do think this is a pretty hard question. What is like a five out of nine on the AP exam? Five out of nine would be, well, um, probably would amount to a really, really strong four. If you got five out of nine on a, a normal AP exam, if you got five out of nine points on the sixth question of the FRQ, that probably meant that the other questions went really well as also. So it probably means you would have gotten a five on it, honestly, uh, because because you got to know that when the when this exam was taken, this was the last 15 minutes of a three-hour exam that kids were working on this problem. So they were probably pretty burnt out at that point and probably going, holy crap, I can't do anything, and I feel really stupid. But if they had gotten five points on it, they actually would have been in really good shape. So, um, so you got to keep that in mind. However, this year, it's all different. I don't know how it's going to look. I think the questions will be more um, in the middle of the range as far as difficulty, not super. There might be a couple things that are super easy, but there's not going to be a bunch of things that are super difficult because they, I just don't know that they can afford to waste a question on something that, that very few people get and still be able to feel like they've, their test has validity. But that's just a, a thought on mine. I don't know. I don't have any basis on that other than how I would make a test. Um, okay, so as soon as as soon as you look at this problem, when you start seeing things like this and this, as soon as those things come up, that's clearly related rates. That's what that's 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 what it's it's coming up with. Is suddenly we're differentiating with respect to time, and so now we have a related rates question. So it kind of is along the same lines of what we did at the beginning, um, where if we take this equation, two x squared plus three y squared minus four x times y equals thirty six, and Again, because of that times in there, we're going to use the product rule. But if we differentiate this with respect to time, and we're going to have to when they, when they suddenly ask us up here to, to find the value of, of this, the derivative of x with respect to time. And, and in here, they give you some information. They tell you, you know, x is equal to 2. They tell you y is equal to negative 2, and they tell you dy dt is equal to 4, and they really ask you to figure out what is dx dt. So that's what they ask you for. So you know, well, shoot, i got to differentiate this with respect to time. So if I differentiate this equation with respect to time, this would be 
4x dx dt plus 6y dy dt minus 4 dx dt times y minus 4x dy dt equals 0. So notice on this one, different from part A, any time I differentiated any variable, x or y, I had to have that extra little tag there because of the chain rule. And so that's where related rates, you have more information, but you're given, um, you're given more, um, you'll, your equation will have more things in it to plug in. Once you have this done, you're really kind of home free in a certain sense because you have all that stuff up at the beginning to plug in. You know, if you look at all this stuff up here that we started out with, all of this stuff, I get to plug in to my equation, and suddenly all I'll have left is just one, one extra variable. Um, so, like, if I go up here and I, and I start plugging all this stuff in that I know, um, I know that I have... Um, 4 times 2, and dx dt is what I'm supposed to find, plus 6 times negative 2 times 4, minus 4 times dx dt times negative 2, um, minus 4 times 2 times 4 equals 0. So all I did is I just plugged a bunch of stuff in, and I, it turns out all I have left is, is this, uh, is, is the dx dt. Um, I, I don't necessarily have to simplify it. Um, you know, um, Dahlia has kind of taken it to, to a whole new level of listening to me and not simplifying it. And um, one answer, um, the answer that she wrote out was, was pretty fantastic. I actually simplified it on the answer key. But if I think about the things here, um, I could move over. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight some things. So I could move over this piece and this piece from the right hand side to the left from the left hand side to the right hand side and i would have um six times two times four because that would be positive now plus four times two times four because that would also be positive because i just added them to both sides then i would have divided by and then if I move over the other stuff here, if I move this piece over, I'm going to do that with division. And I would be moving this piece over with division. On the denominator, I would have 4 times 2 plus 4 times 2. And if I left that just like that, that's a fine answer. If you did some arithmetic on there because you were like, wow, that is really nasty looking, um, that would be fine as well. Um, I think I at least multiplied some things together and wrote 32 plus 48 and then, and then 8 plus 8 on the bottom. And then I did simplify it a little bit further for kids that, were, that maybe would simplify it further. But um, on this part, I'm pretty certain that as far as the points go, this would be worth one point and this would be worth one point. That would be worth two points on that as well. But again, there isn't a single part in this problem other than maybe part A that was easy. There are points to be had in here. Um, 
So if I go back up and I kind of think about the points to be had, um, I would kind of go up and say, okay, part A, I think those are two points that <clears throat> that you ought to know how to do implicit differentiation and and you ought to get those two points. Now, maybe you didn't get them this time. <clears throat> I'm not talking about now. I'm talking about on Tuesday um, after you've done this one and maybe practiced one more. Um, I think that getting this first point um, and plugging in the six into the curve, that's fair. That's that would be that would be a that'd be a good point. This this that first line right here. So like if I were gonna point get, get points here, I'd say I'd say getting this point and this point, that's two, and then that's three. So that's three points. Now, whether you got down and, and solved all this, well, okay, well, maybe you didn't, and that's that's okay. Um, this is four points. I'd say, yeah, that's pretty good. Now, knowing that usually when we do that, we end up substituting it in. Maybe you get that next to one. Maybe you wouldn't. I don't, I don't know. Um, and then... This point right here, because as soon as you know that you're differentiating with respect to time, you know, hopefully you can you can kind of do the same kind of thing you did in part A, and suddenly now you're you're looking at five points um, on a free response question and five points on the sixth free response question on the most difficult one. Yeah, that's pretty amazing, actually. You know, I'm, you know, because there's, I'm sure there are students that got fives on the exam, on this exam, and got two points out of nine on the last free response question because they got so many points on the first couple of free response questions because they were much easier. Um, so, you know, more along the lines of the question you got yesterday, right? I mean, the question you got yesterday, if you got seven on that one, and three on this one. Now suddenly you averaged out to four on those two questions, and 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 that's not bad. Um, any questions on anything on any of this stuff? Um, on part D, would they ever ask you to find dx dt when t is like not equal to one when it's equal no. to one value? Okay, that's a really good question. It's sort of a you kind of get confused. You know, I didn't really use that t equals one. That's basically they're giving that because they they're saying we're working at this time. So they wouldn't ask you to do it at a different time. They'd have to give you so much more information. And remember, they only have nine points to parse out on this. It, it can't be too much. You know, if you're if you got if you got four parts in this, each part is either worth one to I mean at most four points, usually. But that's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think um, what some things that I so I'm gonna hopefully today I'll try to go through and 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 kind of scratch off all the stuff that we've covered as I'm sitting here at the beginning of this distance learning we did stuff on um, separation of variables. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, I couldn't tell you if that's going to be on there. One of the, I, I, I question whether they could do it because you can get, I mean, photo math separates variables really well um, when I've, when I've tried it. Um, so I have a hard time believing that that would be something that they would put on the exam. Um, but they might. So you might go back to those notes on separation of variables. That, that we did um, with this problem and the two things for today, those were the, the ones that AP kind of highlighted in, in saying, here, practice these problems and they're a good um, idea of what the exam is going to look like. Probably not an exhaustive list, but it's probably a pretty good list. Um, 
I'll try to try to do maybe one more or two more things to, to give you. I, um, you know, I don't really want to do a whole lot more um, other than I, I want to make sure that you have enough practice, but not too much practice. Um, I would love to give you another <clears throat> implicit differentiation question so you could have a, have a chance to practice it, it one more time. I felt really good about how well you did as a class on the on the um, the Riemann sum question. I thought that was really pretty fantastic. I mean, I thought the scores were were pretty great, um, and I would guess that that even today's first question is going to go pretty well because it, it's going to be similar to the first distance learning exam that we did actually. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that all this stuff, I'm, I'm just kind of sitting here going, hopefully I got it right. I don't know if I got it right compared to, I don't know if I predicted it right, I guess, is what I'm more or less thinking. I hope I did, but I don't know. Any other questions that I can 